it's, I guess it's taking away all the confusion because what do people do? They get paralysis by analysis. They 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 don't do introspective work. They just they know that something's wrong and they just survive their way through life. They 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 get into routines and habits that don't serve them. They they know they're doing things that that is sabotaging behaviour, but they can't find a way out or don't know how to get out of it. Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We've got a special guest today, Lindsey Bruce, former SAS operator. And uh, now, I guess, you do a lot of other stuff, the Modern Warrior Project being one of them. We'll get into that soon. Um, how's it going? Very well, thanks, my friend. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, where, where are you from? Where did you come from originally? So originally, I grew up in a town called Fort William in northwest Scotland. So it's quite a small place, you know, small population one horse town type type setup but um you know I moved away from there to join the army when I was 17 so about 100 years ago yeah well you know uh what what year was that so I was I joined the army in 1994 so yeah nearly god that just hit me all of a sudden that it's like it'll be 30 years next year so yeah that's that's flown by well what was going on in the world back then you know for uh for the UK and as far as military operations go Back in the 90s, it was uh, more uh, Bosnia mm. was Falk, the main place. Falklands, that, maybe, to a, some degree? No, no. I mean, that was that was then uh, somewhere that the British Army still still sort of uh, conducted exercises and, mm. and they still had you know, people posted there um, until quite recently. But um, that, obviously that was, you know, in the early 80s. But when I joined, it was, it was the main thing really was... Uh, was Bosnia and obviously a few years before that had been the first Gulf War 91 I was still a kid at school then so I missed all that I actually missed Bosnia the first time around as well because um I joined my I was in basic training when my unit were serving in Bosnia on a peacekeeping tour so I just missed that narrowly which was quite annoying at the time because when I turned up at the at, at my at my battalion <clears throat> Everyone who had joined six months and so or so before had a had a medal swinging from their chest, you know, and I missed out on that. So I had, I had an empty chest for the first first few years of service. Mm. So uh, the next thing that came around after that was Northern Ireland. That was the other thing that was that was a regular thing for the British Army at the time was Northern Ireland, which obviously the, the good fit the Good Friday Agreement actually uh, took place in ninety seven when, when we were there. So it wasn't long after that, that the troops pulled out of Northern Ireland. So I was quite lucky to 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 go and serve in Northern Ireland at the time. So, um, yeah, but but at, at that point, you know, Bosnia was really the main thing uh, at the time. And what was it that made you decide to join the military in the first place? <clears throat> Did you have family members that were in before, or was it just, like, kind of purposeless, let's go find something to do? Bit of both, really. Uh, I would say because, because I had a strong military... Uh, sort of bloodline, you know, my, my dad... My dad was really the first one to... To, to join, he came from a really uh, desolate place in, in in the Isle of Skye. So, if you're familiar with Scotland, you've got the the Inner and Outer Hebrides. So, there's a group of islands uh, off the north the north coast of Scotland, northwest coast of Scotland. Um, he came from a place called the Isle of Skye, which was the biggest island in the Hebrides. But he moved to the city of Glasgow when he was about 15, and he was the guy who, for a few years, kicked around doing going from job to job, joining gangs, that type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and eventually he, he probably thought to himself, it was probably going to be continue job to job, not have a career, go to jail or join the army. So he, he said he was passing the careers office one day in Glasgow and, and something just drew him in. And next thing you know, he was in the army. What followed suit then was his, his two brothers actually joined the same the same battalion. So um, so we had strong family heritage by the time we were sort of growing up, me and my brothers. So I've got two older brothers, seven and nine years older respectively. Mm -hmm. And they joined before I did. So I was I was influenced heavily by them, I guess. You know, I, I was always kind of, um, you know, influenced by them from a young age. So I wanted to be like them. So I guess it was just something that felt natural at the time. Mm -hmm. I went to Army Cadets when I was like 13, 14 as well. So um, I guess it felt like a natural progression, but I I wasn't entirely 100% sure whether I was going to do it or not. And there was a point in time where 
I, I wanted to do something a bit different. So I, I thought I'll go to the Marines or I'll go to the parachute regiment. I didn't do very well in school, you see. I, I was I was a bit of a school dropout and I didn't really concentrate in school the, the whole time I was there from a very early age up until when I left. I left without any qualifications and and as a result of that I ended up um I ended up failing the <laughs> failing the basic maths test to join the Marines. And I do believe that everything happens for a reason. So as a result of failing the maths test, I ended up joining the army instead, which was a bit easier to, the entry exam was a bit easier. So I ended up joining the infantry and the rest is history, so they say. Um, yeah, I mean, to back to something you said before, um, and this is something that we'll talk about throughout the episode, but um, <clears throat> people don't really think of interior Scotland as a place where there's gang violence and shit, or not gang violence, but gang, cr- like, we don't associate yeah, it with it. criminal activity unless you're talking about, I guess, train spotting kind of illuminated some of the low level stuff that goes on there. But there is quite a bit of like low level gang activity that's always going on there. Just like yeah. probably just like any city, but it gets, it get it ramps yeah. up pretty hard when the economy sucks. Right. Um, mm-hmm. People just don't, I don't, for whatever reason, I don't know what we associate Scotland with Braveheart and Lagavulin and not necessarily with, you know, petty thieves. Like you would with like mainland Europe. I, I know that if I don't wear my uh, shit the correct way, I'm probably going to get pickpocketed by some asshole. You know what I mean? It's like that's just that's kind of the way it is in cities. But um, anyways, yeah, that's uh, it's interesting you say that, that, that it was your dad's past specifically because this um, this this like aggression motivation that masculinity provides for us. I, I say provides for us because it's a, it's a gift, honestly, that, that's meant to be used to protect our, uh, our society. When it's like, uh, when it's purposeless and not aimed correctly, it will invariably lead to some kind of stupid bullshit. You know what I mean? Always does. It's like the same kind of uh, the fatherless home, no male guidance, uh, uh, and no sense of purpose in life to direct that aggression ends in so many different ways. Uh, it's like terrorism in the Middle East or wherever else, right? It leads to gang violence here. It leads to, uh, uh, you know, in some cases when it turns inward to depression and suicide, but they're all symptoms of the same disease. And it's interesting because I've said this to people a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, and I don't think it's uh, a mystery at all, but finding purpose in life like that almost always is tied to some kind of service or another, like not necessarily military service or even, uh, uh, you know, direct community service, but it'll be service to something or someone. Right. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, that's a good, it's a good, um, it's a really good point because I think it all comes back to misguided or misdirected energy. When we grow up as, as, Adolescence, you know, when, when we are young men or developing into young men, essentially, mm. we've got increasing levels of testosterone. We have a growing ego and all that energy and focus has to go somewhere. And if it doesn't go in one place, it'll go in another. Right. So it's almost like you've got to choose your poison in a way. And that's why you hear a lot of people uh, joining the army because or the military of some sort, because they otherwise would be into petty crime or I mean you hear it with fighters as well right look at like the story of Mike Tyson you know mm-hmm. his energy was directed into being a fighter very effectively as it happens but um hadn't it been for that then that energy would have had to go somewhere and it would have clearly been in all the wrong places even though it ended up being filtering it was filtered into wrong places mm-hmm. at times anyway you know that would have been he'd have undoubtedly ended up in in, in prison no doubt because of his background and his and his uh his upbringing, you know, the influence that he grew up around. Um, so yes, yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's directed and, and guided in a way that it kind of saves people, I think, at a, at a pivotal point in their in their life. Young men who are, you know, they're capable and mm-hmm. they are enthusiastic, and and you just have to make sure that they get they get sort of steered in the right direction, or or they make a choice themselves yeah. for whatever reason, you know. And yeah. Some unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I remember as a kid hearing that idle hands are the devil's plaything or whatever, right? And uh, it never really made that much. Yeah, the devil, the devil makes the devil creates work for idle hands. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, I, I never really, <clears throat> as a kid, I never really understood that that much because I was always busy doing whatever sports or whatever the fuck. Um, 
and uh was like man i just want to fucking take a weekend off once once in a while but you know as i got older and um especially after i got back from what well, from deployment and and when i got out of the military when that it isn't just um it isn't just like the purpose but it's the structure as well right that helps you um yeah because uh, I think part of it is a symptom of paralysis by analysis. Like there's so many options I could do anything. So it's hard to focus on one thing. And then, you know, that just lends itself to the, to the lack of focus in general. But it was, uh, going from such a high operational tempo, not just in my work, but in my life as well to prepare for that work all the time to not having a whole lot going on, fucked me up big time. I mean, it, it was like in my brain, the last six months or so of the, of the time I was in the army, I'm like, I can't wait to get out. I'm just going to fucking relax for a while because it had been, you know, a challenge. Um, and I guess it felt good for like a week, maybe two. And then I was just like, man, this fucking sucks. I didn't think it out loud, but my brain and body knew that I was fucked up. They knew that this was not the right thing to be doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately back then, you know, there, there were people, we didn't have this like digital media infrastructure to go out and find someone who had been through this that had detailed their process and figured out like, hey, you know, I know what you're thinking right now, but you're wrong. Here's my experience. So you should probably at least keep an eye out for it, right? Because it's going to pop up at some point. We just didn't have that back then. I'm glad that we do now. I'm glad that like people like yourself, there's so many of us now people like me, fucking Tim Kennedy, Mike Ritland, so many Sean Ryan, people that have like high tempo operational experience who have come back and, and well, Tim Kennedy never slows down, but the rest of us slow down for a little bit, figure out that we can't move at that slow pace. And then we have to figure out something else. It's nice to see that example and have people out there talking about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's an important part to slow down. A lot of people don't know how to slow down and it, 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 they just become a, a victim of their own, their own habits and, and, and part, behavioral patterns and, and and you know belief structure I suppose, and I think that's because a lot of people are are afraid to slow down and definitely afraid to stop because it means facing some things they might not want to face, but it's not until you start to take account for some of the things that you might need to adjust because at the end of the day the, the military is a chapter in our lives, it was for you it was for me and what what I see going wrong is when someone tries to move on and they still try and keep hold or, or keep a grasp on the old chapter and drag it with them. And it's not always conducive to the best outcome because they end up just living in, you know, living in the past and they don't fully submerge themselves in something new or are just too afraid to. And that, that and the initial step is just to slow down, maybe stop and take account for what's going on in your life and say, right, you know, what this worked for me so far, this mindset worked for me so far, this level of aggression worked for me so far, it might not work anymore. I might need to start changing the way that I go about things. And that could be from going from military life to civilian life, having to manage people differently, uh, having to just almost like change change your uh, change your coat or change your jacket on 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 whatever it is. Because mm. I went through that and I struggled with that. You know, that's one thing I struggled with, which which was um, you know, trying to be trying to operate in the same way. Now, there's a lot of good traits that come from the military. It's a very good foundation for life. It teaches you basic life skills, discipline, structure, and a whole lot of other things. But they're not, they don't necessarily, you know, cross, they don't necessarily cross over into, into civilian street. And a lot of people don't understand someone who's been in the military and the person in the military doesn't understand people who've never been in the military. So you end up getting this real disconnect uh, with with two chapters of your life, and I that's something I really struggled with. Uh, I failed to understand people, and as a result of that, communication was affected. Communication was affected, then results were affected as a, mm. because of that. So, yeah, I mean, you've got to just adjust. Uh, and I think these days, something you said earlier, that you're glad you're glad we've got all this digital media and people out there. But another thing is is that people end up just sort of stacking more mm. on top. And then there's so much information out there that they end up just with this fucking, you know, so much information that it's like, what do I do with it? There's almost too much to choose from. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, you know, <clears throat> to your point about, uh, I, I guess the, the skills and habits that we learn in the military, you have to strip away the circumstances and remember the principles, right? 
Like this is this is something that is true in every facet of life, whether it's you know your own mental health, your physical health, or um, your relationships with people, whether they be your family or business or, or friends or whatever else is going on. Uh, people feel like, well, there's two very extreme cases that that a lot of people unfortunately fall into. One is like when I take the uniform off, my duty is over. Uh, that's definitely not true. And you're not going to feel satisfied as a human being if you fucking continue that way. And the other one yeah. is, you know, like, like you're alluding to is being stuck in, well, I'm still a sergeant in the army or whatever, right? I'm still, you know, whatever in the, in whatever group, like, no, you're not anymore, but there's still like, you, you should definitely lean on that experience, but you have to understand you're not there anymore. So yeah. what is it about that experience and that training that is beneficial in any kind of circumstance. Uh, one, the quality of my character. I'm a servant leader, right? I lead by serving people and I protect them because that's what I was built to do. I could be calm in chaos. Uh, I'm organized, I'm disciplined. Uh, I, I know how to plan things. Um, these, these are all extremely valuable traits, especially to be able to do those things under stress. Most people don't like, frankly, most civilian people don't even get the opportunity to learn how to do that. You know what I mean? Especially not in something as, I guess, chaotic and dangerous as a military operation. So, yeah, all those things are good. Forget about the military aspect of it and think just about the traits and principles, right? And those can be applicable anywhere. That's one of the harder things for a lot of guys is how to translate. Like, we talk a lot about translating our military service into education or into a uh, fucking uh, uh, resume or something. But translating it into just being a human being out in the regular world now is the real key, I think. Yeah, and that's the challenge. That, I think that's the that's the hardest part because you can take all the stuff that is to do with the military and into a working environment. You can get away with it to a point and, and keep certain traits, especially when it comes to uh, assertiveness, uh, directness, leadership. Some people really like that. You know, there are, there are some people that will follow your Instagram, my Instagram, who kind of like the side of us that is very military still to the core mm. so the way that we, the way that we conduct ourselves the way that we carry ourselves on a daily basis the way we talk <clears throat> there are people that really thrive on that and then you get the other the other situation where you you just it just doesn't fit in you know it doesn't it's not really a good fit and, and people kind of are repelled by it I, I remember once when i when i first left the military the first job that i got uh, was teaching uh, it was teaching you know media groups foreign foreign commonwealth office uh, personnel and the, the course was called surviving hostile regions so it was essentially just a course on how to look after yourself and the environment they were going into whatever it was and myself and, and one of my good friends were both from the same squadron both got out at the same time both landed the same job and it was great you know great days but uh, everyone in that company had to do a like a teaching qualification that was kind of along the lines of this isn't this is how you teach here this is how you teach civilians, uh, not how you teach in the military, but it's very difficult to go from when you've been training junior soldiers on how to handle a weapon. It's a certain military training is very, very direct. It's very, mm. it's very, uh, there's so much red tape around it. And it has to be that way because you're, you're potentially training recruits that have never picked up a weapon, a firearm before. So it has to be very methodical, very strict, very structured. Problem being like, when I when I got that job, I was I ended up subconsciously talking to people like they were like they were they were military recruits, and it just didn't really work that well. There were people that loved it, and the people that were kind of like, "I'm scared of you," because like one of my friends says, "Look, these people are going to be like scared of you because of the way you're teaching, because it was just being in such you know talking to them in such a direct way." And so that was one of the first lessons I I took from this isn't going to work everywhere you go you need to kind of soften things a little bit in some cases and i think the more you get to know yourself and the more you the more you mature as a man uh, and the more you do the deep work in yourself and and realize who you are at the core not not what's been built mm -hmm. for a purpose for a reason for a period of time in your life so i always see the military as a chapter <clears throat> it gave me a great foundation for life and I, and i and i take a lot of that with me to this day but there's certainly a lot that I've had to adapt and change. And that's come, a lot of that's come with deep work in myself to find out who I am at the core without all that. 
um, so that you can effectively communicate with people because people, when you communicate with them, they need to feel you. And we've all been in front of someone who is who has got this kind of suit of armor on, this this metaphorical suit of armor or this archetypal sort of facade that's been molded through time. Or, you know, it's a bit like when you talk to someone um in a, in, a, in a, you know, if you go into a, a store and you get customer service personnel talking to you, they'll talk to you like a customer. And there's a very different conversation and uh, sort of environment that, that happens there and, and instead of just two human beings communicating at a level that we can both really understand and feel. And I think that's the difference. Like when someone talks to you, like you can really feel it like human being rather than just two characters talking to each other and speaking and behaving the way they think they have to be in that situation. You am making sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I think going from the military to, I mean, I like to be a bit of a chameleon. You've got your the way that you talk. You've got the, the, the character that you become, but it has to be really authentic. And I think a lot of it, for me anyway, for a long time, it felt like I was taking this character forward in life that just wasn't really fitting into all situations that I had to be involved with. So I had to change mm-hmm. and I had to improve my communication skills. I had to become more empathetic to, to human beings. For example, when I used to coach people in my gym, I couldn't relate to people a lot of the time because I didn't understand why they would bitch and moan about doing something or because something was painful because they hadn't followed a diet or they hadn't mm-hmm. they hadn't done what I, I had instructed them to do, so to speak. <laughs> and I couldn't really relate to people. I just thought, dry your eyes, stop bitching and moaning, get fucking on with it. But that didn't work for a lot of people. And it wasn't until I got a bit of an epiphany one day with one client that I realised I need, I need, I've got some fucking learning to do here about people. Because mm. uh, this isn't a one-size-fits-all. It's not in the military anymore. Yeah, for where, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's well, we know this, right? We know this um, in academia, we know this, because um, when, when we teach technical writing specifically, um, one of the most critical parts, aside from just precision of language in technical writing, is making sure you're writing to the level of the audience's uh, uh, yeah. uh, skill set or, or a, like, beneath their level of ignorance even to some degree, right? Like, if I use a bunch of technical terms to try to explain some new piece of technology to people who are uninitiated, I've wasted yeah. everybody's time. That's a complete waste of fucking time, right? And in the same way, like, the the if you can tailor the... If you can tailor the language, I suppose, to the audience, then you can also tailor the tone of the language to the audience, right? Like you, when you, when you talk to, and this isn't to demean people who are not military, because I don't mean that's not, that's not what I mean by this. But when you're talking to a child, it's really helpful to get on a knee and get down at their level, right, and talk directly into their face instead of looking down at them. Uh, I mean that it, it's obviously that that work. It's or it's obvious that that would work better. So I, you know, it, it is difficult for us that have been. I guess, meat eaters for so long to soften a little bit. And, you know, uh, when it's a child, it's easy. But when it's a, another adult, it's like, come on, man. You know what I mean? But that's that's stupid of us, right, to think that way, I guess. Yeah. And it, and it does take time. I mean, I've, I've done speaking events in the past where it's been either recorded, I've watched video back, or someone's been with me that's given me feedback. And it took me a long time to shake that that manner, I feel like. And, and it's something that I think... I would I would never like to completely jettison the whole thing because uh, I think there's there's value to it, but at the same time it's for me it's all about you know you know when someone can really feel you connecting with them. So I, I mean I did an event recently with my my warrior project and it, there was a there was a difference uh, in how it was delivered and how it was received and and I got some of the feedback I got just you know not because I asked for it just people just came forward and said look. Can I make a few observations? Uh, one of the guys, in fact, the other day, and it was almost like the the way that I communicate with people now is just on a deeper level, just because I I try and kind of feel feel who I'm trying to talk to in the sense that I'm, I'm really trying to connect with them at a, at a core level um, with empathy and understanding it from where they are, um, and it's a bit like. Something I was something else I was probably guilty of up until a couple of years ago was that people coming onto the Modern Warrior Project, for example, I subconsciously was kind of like, 
well, metaphorically going, if you want to be up here with us, then come on up here. You, you know, not in a way that I was trying to suggest I was better than anybody, but you're almost talking to them from a different level that you're already there. You're already got your shit squared away. You, you're you're training hard. You've got yourself in shape. You've your life's looking good, and everyone else that's, that's followed that path is also doing well at different levels. You that is just coming to inquire, you're still kind of there, and it's not the, not talking down to people, but it, I can't, I kind of guess it might have come across that way at times where you're 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 almost suggesting to people that they're not quite where you are yet, so come on up and join us. But what I realise works a lot more effectively is when you go down to wherever they are, and that's not down to their level, like I'm saying. I'm not not literally like that, but I'm talking about meeting them where they are mm. and and really understanding. And, and and communicating them with them at a level that they know that you understand where they're coming from. And then they're like, wow, you know, this is kind of it's a bit like like you know, when when gymnasiums when they put out adverts of people with muscles and, and, and six packs and it just repels all the people who really need the gym. Mm. You know, the, the, the muscle heads are always going to find your gym because that's what they need. That's what that's what their life is about. You know, they just want to know how heavy your dumbbells are. Whereas the person who's overweight sat on the couch might be like, I'm too scared to go to the gym. And all they see is, is adverts of people who are already in shape and it's a really bad method of marketing. So that's why in the gym world, it's the best thing to do is show people who were, where they are now. And then maybe this is where they were and now they're here, but they were once there and emphasize that. So it all comes back, comes down to that that communication aspect of how you, how you can communicate with people and, and, and connect with them so that you can help them, you know, because to allude to what you said earlier, you know, you, you're just, uh, you, you're a, a a servant leader, you know, you you lead to serve others, uh, which is a huge thing. I think that's a huge important important point there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we, I agree with you. You don't. There's no need to jettison the entirety of of that like super resilient and strong attitude that you develop in the military. That you like, you certainly don't want to jettison that. Um, that's who we are. Yeah, I mean, that's that's at your core. That's who you are, and you know. Uh, Andrew Jackson used to say that um, one man with courage makes a majority. So this idea that like one squared away dude who decides to do something can inspire other people to do it as well. That's a real thing. Psychological phenomenon for sure. Um, and but but to the point of like. I, I guess maybe we see it as coddling to some degree once we've experienced it at a pretty brutal level for a while. But that's not really true. I mean, even when we train soldiers, when we're doing AARs and stuff afterwards, we follow certain models that are intended to reinforce good behavior, right? So, like, sustain, improve, sustain. Like, here's some good stuff you did. Here's some shit that we need to improve on. And then you close it with, by the way, you really did well at these things, right? And it's not to be demeaning or treat them like children or anything. It's to remind them that, like, you know, the point of this isn't to be punished. Leadership isn't about punishing people for bad behavior, and it's honestly, it's not even about rewarding them for good behavior. It's about giving them the confidence to build like good habits on their own so that in the absence of direct leadership, they can lead. You know what I mean? That's the real point of leadership. And this is the, the, the funny thing about this is um, <laughs> pretty much every discussion you have about leadership is kind of a parallel discussion about being a parent, right? These are the same traits that we want out of a father. You know what I mean? Whether yeah. we, whether it's one of our father figures or, or the <clears throat> excuse me, the kind of father we want to be, it's almost the same conversation every time. So you know, it's it's no surprise that in Western culture, as the the emphasis on good fatherhood has waned to some degree, so has the performance of our younger men. Well, they've vicariously learned through us. Hmm. So if we can demonstrate good behavior, that's the best way of of leading uh, rather than trying to force someone to do something. So a lot of the time you've got to just demonstrate the value and eventually hope it catches on. And usually it does, you know, if it's like the whole environmental factor. You become, you become an average of the people you spend time around, you become a product of the environment, all this kind of stuff that we hear all the time. It is true. And it starts at home, starts with the parents, starts with the family. Um, and then it filters out. And that's when kids then have to find their own identity and their own purpose and all that sort of stuff. But it starts with, it starts with the, with the household, right? And you know we have to be that living example, which I think is and it's the same as leadership. You first have to lead yourself. You know, mm -hmm. lead thyself before you can lead anyone else. Um, at least be on the path. And again, going back to the 
like the personal trainer type type thing. You know, the, the personal trainer doesn't have to have a ripped six pack, three six five. They just have to be doing the things that they are they are advocating that people do. And they might have once been out of shape, and they might be now halfway there. They might not be in great shape, but as long as they are living that lifestyle, they're leading by example. And if they're getting results with that, then great. So I think being the example is the, is the fir- is the first thing. You know, you cannot you cannot expect people to do things that you advocate when you're not doing them yourself. It's as simple as that. I think that's a really good place to to start. Like if you're um, if you are someone who feels lost or whatever, um, post military especially, you're feeling like you don't have any real purpose anymore, or maybe. Yeah, there's some other environmental factor that's that's making you feel that way. Uh, the best place for, to start is is by finding something to be responsible for, right? So start with your own daily habits. What what bad habits do I have? All right, I'm going to X those out first, and then second step is I'm going to start creating good habits now, right? Like w- ones that serve others around me holding the door for people, picking up fucking trash when I see it, or just, you know, being a responsible human being, thinking about the kind of world I want to live in, articulating that to my, like, here's the man that I want to be. I want to be the kind of man that does one, two, three, four, five, and then I go out and change my behavior to fit that fucking model. That's how you become a good man, right? That's, that's it. It's not a fucking secret or anything. You decide. The only person that can stop you from doing the right thing is you. That's a fact. So, yeah. you know, <clears throat> one of those things... I think is you have to first identify, and it's difficult for people, you have to identify what exactly the fuck is wrong with you. You know what I mean? You said that, uh, you know, you did a lot of deep work on yourself. What did that look like for you? Because it's a little different for everybody. Yeah, sure it is. There's there's certainly some common traits along the way. Uh, And it's usually different than what you expect as well, because you're so ro- you're so wrapped up in the in the programming you've had for your whole life that you don't really know anything else you don't ident- you don't necessarily identify the things that are potential flaws in your personality in your character the things that you're doing they might not be that obvious to you become because we, we can all be a little bit narcissistic and a, l- a little bit ego driven especially if you've been in the military especially if you've been in the special forces i mean it, it goes without saying you need that to a point but you have to train it and then you have to let it become your friend and not your foe and the problem that most people have is that their ego becomes the enemy and they let that run the show. It's a bit like being led by your monkey brain. Uh, typically, you know, we, us guys, guys like us, a typical thing is to think with your head and shut off emotionally because you, you almost have to. There's a period of your life when you're, when you're doing, you know, operations and you're, you're serving that life of uh, the military. And if you're, especially if you're an active service, you have to condition yourself to deal with certain environments. It's 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 the only way because otherwise you could you could crack. And so, and this is part of what I was saying earlier about how that archetype doesn't necessarily fit into the, the the the, the normal world, should we say? Uh, because you have to have a conditioning to do a job. You have to be like everybody else to a point. You have to know the same things. You have to live by principles, procedures, drills, rules. And so when it comes to doing deep work in yourself, you almost need to strip all that back and find out what's underneath at the core level, at the emotional level, because we forget how to be emotional. How many time, how many, how many guys do you know who have been told by women that they're emotionally unavailable? Mm. They're, they're dark as shit because they don't know how to, they don't know how to, they don't know how to emotionally connect with somebody at any level, right? Because that's the conditioning that we've had. And it serves that. It serves the job. It serves the purpose that we have professionally. But it, it hinders a lot of other things later on in life. That's, that's one of the challenges. And so I suppose for me, a huge part of this, and this is quite a recent thing as well, by the way, is that I had spent a long time just living in my head. Mm. Uh, and not understanding anything else. And when people would say it to me, I mean, I, I spoke to people, you know, professional people, I went to see psychics and people would tell me in, 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 in general life as well, people that I knew, friends and family even, uh, I would be told things like, I was taking myself too seriously. Uh, I, um, I was very emotionally shut off. I was 
um, unapproachable. People that knew me best knew that wasn't the case, but people that didn't know me so well might have that first impression of me. And it's a lot. A lot of it's a sort of mask because it's a, it's a conditioning that we have. Like so. So I guess when I went down this route of trying to strip all that back to find who I really am, mm. you know, who, that whole question about who who really am I. And I think we all ask ourselves that question is because that's what we can, you know, when people say things like, what's my purpose, you know, especially if you've been in the military or had a career that's been significant in your life at, for a certain time, you then feel a bit lost, like we, like we discussed. And that can be a hard transition. So when you then ask yourself things like, what's my purpose? And a lot of people struggle with this because they don't have this big grandiose idea of what their life should be mapped out like because someone else has got this and someone else has got that. We must have something similar, whereas it's not the case. We're all individual. We're all we're all unique in our own right. But it can be a confu- it can be a confusing subject when you think, "What is my purpose? Why am I here? What the fuck am I doing? Who am I? You know, who am I at the core level? Not who I was. Not the SAS soldier, the bodybuilder, the whatever whatever else the case may be. Who am I at my core level? So that's where the deep work comes in. And for me, it, it always comes back to. Uh, sort of getting out of my head and into my heart and, and it's something that at the time when I even spoke about it or when, when someone else suggested it to me it would all feel a bit weird it would feel really fluffy it would feel wrong it wouldn't feel like me because I can't talk about things like emotions and love and my heart and all that sort of stuff because it's really fluffy and I'm like I get away from me but that's because your your condition is protecting you from moving forward and moving past that and until you break all that down you can't you can't re- then release that part of you that's going to serve you more than ever because that's what people feel mm. yeah it's uh it's easy to stay in your own head like that i mean especially we're we're definitely like human beings are generally prone to egocentric behavior um mm. <clears throat> and then for people that operate at a very high level in whatever field it is we build a worldview, particularly when you work super hard to get to where you are and then perform well in that, uh, in that arena, um, yeah. that, you know, you start to think, well, I'm right. I've put in the work, these people, these other people are wrong, you know, and sometimes that might be true, but <clears throat> it's not always true. It's, it's <sighs> like you, 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 you keep saying this about stripping things down. You got to ask yourself fundamental questions that expose your core principles or your lack of core principles, or maybe they're underdeveloped, right? So like, am I actually good at what I'm doing or am I so strong that I'm able to fight my way through it? You know what I mean? Because we've seen people use bad strategy, but they're an incredible athlete or something, right? So they're able to fucking skirt past that or they're really quick witted, but they didn't do the prep work. You know what I mean? So they managed to get through it, but it's not that there's no substance here. It's like a startup company with too much money spending their way out of problems that should have been lessons learned. You know what I mean? And then they just build a house of cards that eventually topples. You have to be like, I mean, one of the things that should be part of anybody's principle set is self-examination. You shouldn't be stuck in your own head all the time uh, with imposter syndrome, wondering if you're doing the right thing, but you should definitely be free. You should frequently ask yourself, are the actions that I'm taking with the, with this attitude that I have, leading me towards the goal that I actually want, right? Or is it, or am I being a fucking hardhead about it? Because we're, we're pretty prone to do that as well. Yeah, and, and the thing is, to, to, to sort of um, expand on something you said a second ago about are, are, you, are you just hard enough to fight, fight through things and get through, that'll work, that'll work so far. It worked so far, it worked a long time for me. But every time you do that, you, you're still, you're still avoiding certain things that could potentially be a better way. And not only that, when you're fighting through things all the time and making everything a fight, there's there's residue that builds up that has to be purged at some stage. And if it's not, it's just going to make things worse. And, and, and you get the same situation with potentially building a house of cards that eventually topples. That's a great saying. I love that. And, and it's the same with the stagnant shit that we collect over the years because it has to be stored somewhere. It's no different than avoiding emotions that have to be expelled. And then because you don't know how to release certain emotions, you then just bottle it up and it just builds this pressure cooker cooker within you. Uh, and that then starts to show up in certain certain traits, certain behaviours, emotional uh, 
um, states and general feeling of how you are as a human being. So I think some things, you can fight through some things for sure, and some things should be fought through, but it has to be managed on the flip side of that. It's a bit like training. It has to, it has to have recovery. Mm. It has to have nutrition to back up to, to fill that void. That's now, you know, if you break something down, you need to rebuild it again. So you have to live in these two, these, these different parameters, this, these different, different sort of um, different levels. Uh, and I think a lot of the time, when the ego is running the show, when you've built up a conditioning over time, when you're used to just fighting for everything all the time, and your life becomes a fight by default, subconsciously you don't, you won't even know that you're doing that. Mm. And eventually you have to find a way to balance that out. Otherwise, shit starts to go wrong later on. Sure, right? yeah. So, and you also, like, if you get stuck in that mindset, you're no longer able to communicate in a, in a way that isn't a fight anymore. We see this in relationships all the time, but this happened, this permeates through people's professional and uh, 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 just public life with their friends as well. Some people can only communicate through conflict, which is, you know, that's a, that's one method, I guess, but it fucking sucks. I mean, you're always stressed the fuck out and everybody around you stressed the fuck out. And if you're a man and you do that, like your job as a man is to make people feel protected around you, right? Provided for and protected. That's the purpose of masculinity. And if you're just hopping from one like chaotic moment to the next, just because you can, you can do that, you're not functioning at the highest possible level. And a lot of it sounds like... A lot of it does sound kind of like self-help platitudes sometimes, which is why I like to tie it back to um, <clears throat> principles because your principles in life are kind of like a company's mission statement, right? Like wh whatever – here, the mission statement is the, the most base-level definition of what you want to accomplish, right? So you make yourself a list of goals that you want to accomplish, um, and then try to find a single sentence that defines, you know, the, the type of the type of behavior it takes to get to that place. Right. And I, I think that's I, I think that is a very difficult thing for a lot of people. I think it's a very high barrier to entry for people who are trying to get their life back on the right track, because there's like you said before, there's so many different answers to this question. There's a lot of noise out there and uh, quite a bit less substance. You know what I mean? Um, so that's why, like, you know, a couple of people are, are doing good good work there. Obviously, Jordan Peterson's Principles for Life, it isn't just about the individual principles, but more about the uh, discussion around them and explaining why these things are important to people. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's, you know, for this show, I like to think about what kind of, because our culture's in trouble. I think that if, when the individual is, the most free they will put more into the country and into their community than they normally would. Right. People are generally more, uh, uh, more giving, I guess, or more selfless when times aren't quite so tough. So then mm -hmm. our goal as men should be to make times, you know, not as tough. Right. So people can be more giving. And then we, we get to that point and this has happened all throughout human history. We get to that point and then we fucking relax. But there's no point that you can relax. You know what I mean? You have to keep. So once you get to the point where life is somewhat comfortable, it becomes even more daunting to keep people inside of this principled lifestyle because, you know, they start to slip a little bit. We all, like as a culture, we start to slip. When things, we, when we don't have to do certain things just to stay alive anymore, we stop yeah. doing them. You know what I mean? Which is, which doesn't make, make any sense. Like, I, I, I'm, we get to a certain point. I mean, it's like an athlete who has a good year and then takes the summer off. You know what I mean? And they come back and they suck the next year. That's, that's what we, yeah. that's our tendency in culture. And, uh, there's gotta be a way that we can stave that off at some point. I mean, we're not stupid. We're pretty smart. We put people on the moon. We split the atom. We could figure this out. There's, I mean, I mean you can really dig into this and there's, there's a lot of stuff there you could really get in some rabbit holes with. We probably don't have enough time in, in, in one episode of this, but yeah, you've 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 sort of uh, you've said a few things there that made me really think of a few things that I have my own opinion on. And when you said about the the you know men are there to create uh, good times, but they're not that ultimately can lead to weak 
people, right? So there's a saying that what remind me of, I'm thinking about off the top of my head here, but you know, strong men create good times. Good, good times, times create weak men. Weak men weak create men. hard times, yeah. Hard times, yep. yeah. And good times, this is the only bit that I have to counter here. And this is where I think that we have to, that sometimes we need to read something or hear something and go, right, what do I what do I really think about that? If I was to dissect that in my own mind, what do I what do I truly think about that? And why? And that saying is one of them that there was a point in life where I'd have gone, I really like that and I like all of it. And I'm gonna repost that on Instagram because it's true. And I think I actually actually have posted that exact quote in the past. But then at some point a while ago, I, I, I looked into that and I thought to myself, okay, the part where it says good times create weak men, then you got to ask, well, why? Mm. And does it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that way. There's another there's another problem. There's, there's there are reasons why that happens. And it comes down to the not just the core level of the individual, but I suppose the 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 lack of purpose within that individual seeing the bigger picture of why they should be living a certain way with structure, with principles, with values. And if everyone did that, good times would just create more good times, eventually leading to a mass population of a better a better living environment for humanity. So so I have to that's the only bit with that I've got a bit of a question with them thinking why why does it have to be that but why do people just believe that and i think it's because we are so we are so used to being conditioned by situations and other people over the, over a long period of time that we have these beliefs that don't necessarily always stack up mm. or they shouldn't have to stack up we should and i think the only way forward for for human beings is to is to ask questions about everything ask better questions don't just go along with it and go yeah this is fucking you know, what he said, and I respect him. Jordan Peterson said this, and I mm. love Jordan Peterson, by the way. I think he's he's a very, very wise man. Uh, and I think a lot of the things he talks about, I mean, I, I know, I think, anyway, you might know better than me, but a lot of what Jordan Peterson talks about relates a lot to the Bible, for example. Mm. <clears throat> the Bible relates to uh, things like values and principles, and it's obviously a religious book, right? So, there's a there's a bigger reason why why people would follow that why people would be part of any religion or anything that's got strong principles involved with it right so if you take any religion for example people who follow a particular type of religion have certain beliefs that they stick to and they and they won't go left and right off and whatever your take is in whatever religion it's not the point the fact of the matter is the individual has strong beliefs in something that it makes them feel part of something else that's bigger than them. And it, it, it can make them in some way, in some cases anyway, better people, you know, better people that live better lives with more fulfillment, more purpose, um, with, with more of a sense of uh, community with their fellow man, for example. Um, so I think that if we can all adopt something that, gives us that same value from a core level. Individually, we become better people in a, in a collective of a better population. So if we can influence people to think better, more mature, more empathetic, less selfish, then if that can then be passed on and spread, we create this collective consciousness, if you like, of a different way to live. And that's really what I come back to with all, everything I do. Uh, it wasn't always that way, but the way I think about it now is that if I can if I can reach certain people with certain things, and they can tell three people each, one person each, I am contributing. You're contributing. People like us are contributing to a a better humanity, because none of us want the shit that's going on in the world right now. None of us want that, but there are certain people who do want that because it's profitable or it's serving their selfish interests. It's adding to the control factor, mm. and what what happens? We not we want, maybe not want to go down this rabbit hole, but we we've been part of a system that had a high level of control. We did a job because that was what we did. But when you when you look at the huge picture on a, on a global scale, for as far back as any of us could probably read about, there's been an ulterior motive 
to do with control. And we're just a link, we're just, we're just a, a little cog in that very large machine. But I think that, you know, if we can, I think if we, if we asked everybody who's ever served in the military, for example, is this something that you thought was a good idea to be in a place fighting wars? You'd rather have just taken all of that away and, and, and you know, fight for peace rather than, you know, we all fight for peace anyway, obviously, but, you know, this whole thing about the warrior, for example, you know, I, I, I always like a question that I was once asked when I was making everything a fight in my life. It was like, well, what is the, I coach men over 40. So I thought, well, what does the warrior do when the war's over? Kind of similar to what we we're talking about with the whole military going into civilian street transition. You know, when, when the war is over, what does the warrior then do? And I think that's when we really dig deep into ourselves and find out who we are as human beings and how we can be most effective to humanity and contribute to that in a better way than we maybe have have done. Or you know, you know, you know what I'm going mm -hmm. with it, but yeah. don't want to get into a waffle. But I kind of the point being is is really about how how can we think better? How can we encourage other people to think better and it's about getting away from the superficial bollocks of what we mm. tend to focus on and the things that we can necessarily do or you know what can i what can i buy what can i do what can i fix outside it's like it's not about what's out there it's a bit it's, it's everything you fucking need is is inwards that's where the answers are so stop looking outwards at all the stuff and the things and the people and the principles and the all the shit the books and whatever podcast you need to listen to you know that's all valuable stuff, and we all we all need that stuff. But at the same time, people miss a massive point, which is, unless you introspectively look at things, you're never going to get the answers, because it isn't out there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you don't you don't want to become like a serial contrarian or anything like that, but uh, you do want to challenge the status quo. This fatalistic idea of like that's how it's always been done or this is how you do it is uh, poison, man. We've got to, like you said, we've got to figure out a way to keep making strong men even when times are good right it's not a it's not a foregone conclusion that we can't do that i don't feel like that's the case so um there's so there, like a lot of people have said some smart stuff about this and maybe mm. they understood what they were saying maybe it was just a platitude at the time but when jfk said you know don't ask what you your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country he was kind of saying the same thing that gk chesterton one of your guys authors used to say which was uh men didn't love Rome because she was great. Rome was great because the men loved her, right? And it's a, it's a very important distinction um, when you say that <clears throat> it isn't just um, for your own sake that you're doing this stuff. It is for society. So having whatever it happens to be, that, that higher purpose, whether it is, you know, your religion or your family or your, or your uh, country or whatever it is, it strips away the self to some degree, right? Because the more you look, uh, you should you should always look inward to try to keep your house in order. But the more you just sit around and, and think about your own feelings, the more and more manic and depressed you're going to get. I mean, that's a, that's just that way madness lies. I believe someone said it's like you can't do that stuff. So you know, it isn't that you should distract yourself, um, and you should be very aware of your your actions and motivations, but every re, realize that every meaningful thing you do in your life will be in the service of other people everything you'll never do something for your life for yourself that really matters you know what i mean like even making yourself a better purpose or person is toward the purpose of being a better husband a better father a better leader in your community whatever it is right it's always going to come down to that um <clears throat> and i wonder so you you asked the question um about what does a warrior do when the war is over <sighs> And I'll say this, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, from my perspective, it's to prepare the next generation, right. To, to not just be a warrior, but to be a servant leader again, stripping it down all the way to the core principle. Um, because if you can reach someone, you can change their lives, but if you can teach them to reach others, you can change everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that that's the skill set that a lot of us have developed over time in the in the military and other stuff to be able to uh, we we call it train the trainer right which just sounds like some goofy corporate term at this point in in my life but it, it's a it's a really meaningful thing it's a really meaningful thing to not just make somebody competent but make them an actual leader so they can go make other people competent. Mm -hmm.
it's a, it's a chain reaction then. And like something you said about, you know, what was it you said a minute ago about the, uh, about when you're you're looking inwards. It's something about something about madness you said about that way. Madness inwards. lies, yeah. Yeah, but this is where it becomes really interesting because you've got a bit, a bit of a dichotomy there because if someone doesn't look inwards at all, there's going to be problems. If someone looks inwards in the wrong way or not in not in the way that is going to get the job done, mm-hmm. it can also end up to it being you know o- over analysis of yourself and then and then getting kind of feedback doesn't really work to your advantage but that's when there has to be the, the right type of introspection but that's like a skill it's like how do you how do you do introspective work i said to someone the other day about meditation this is well how do you switch off how do you not think about anything when you're trying to think about meditation how do you not think about it it's like it's a tough thing to it's a tough thing to explain and to mm-hmm. describe to somebody and it's almost like you don't know until you've experienced it what it feels like. It would be like trying to say to someone uh, that's never, ever touched alcohol how to explain what it feels to be drunk. And that's a bad example because I'm not advocating getting drunk because we've all been drunk, right, unless we drank alcohol. But if you're trying to explain something to someone that, that is only something you can really, you can you can only really fully get if you've experienced it. I mean, something like ayahuasca is a, is, a, is a good example of that because I recently did ayahuasca in a plant medicine retreat. And I'd heard about people talking about ayahuasca and San Pedro and other plant medicines. And, and people will explain it and they'll try to describe what it feels like and, and what what happens when, you, when you're when you in the in the experience. And you, you kind of take that forward and go, okay, so maybe I can expect this. And then what you get is totally fucking different. Mm not what you thought it was so you don't the only way you're going to know is when you then do it and experience that yourself then you go ah then you tell someone they're going to be the same thing and i suppose it's it's not until you do the introspective work that's kind of fucking scary Mm -hmm. it's deep and it takes courage and it takes time and it takes patience then you go right the answers are here i just wasn't sure where to look or how to look before I'd done all this shit in the past, you know, but you're very much in your head still, and 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 this is the this is the problem. When when it ends badly, when introspection doesn't end in the right way or doesn't get the progress someone needs, or they just it's because they stay in their fucking heads, and they don't know how to get out of their heads until they're out of the heads, and 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 that's something that just happens, and then you go, ah, I fucking, I get it now. It's like the pieces to a puzzle. You go, now I see where the picture is, and until you get to that point, you just don't really get it. Um, so yeah, it's just a point I thought I'd make because like introspective work, I think the the answers are there, but you just need to mm-hmm. do it in the right way, and yeah, that can sure. maybe take, that can take. I'm not saying it takes what, what you know, it doesn't take any plant medicine or anything, but it certainly takes guidance. I would say because we become so fucking conditioned in a way that we just don't know how to get out of the way that we think. I think the plants how- are really helpful. You know, like so, good psychotherapy is going to take. Th- this is just based on average statistics, it's different for everybody, but three to five years, right? Yeah. And what it does is it leads you to your own realizations and conclusions. It, it the, the, the point of the therapist, the psychotherapist, is to listen to what you're saying, redirect until you have that aha moment, right? And then try to teach you some coping skills or some improvement skills after that, right? That's kind of the, the point of good psychotherapy. Plant medicine leads to the same place. I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday. Um, <clears throat> it will make your brain ask and answer questions that you have been hiding from right because you can't control your conscious mind anymore it's all subconscious stream of consciousness that's it right so it'll it'll force you to ask and answer questions that you were afraid of before and that's the kind of introspection you should be looking for not sitting around Mm -hmm. thinking about like oh woe is me or i'm a victim or any of that stupid bullshit right it should be you you jump into the pool you swim your laps and you get the fuck out that that's the purpose here right and I think it's like, I, I don't know, I've never seen anything as effective as plant medicine at doing specifically that. No, no, I mean, either, actually. In fact, to the point where I mean, there's I a reason actually... people have been using it for thousands of years, right? It wasn't just to get uh, high, dude. No, and it's not something that's just come, out, come around, it's been around for yeah. a long, like, it's yeah. long, long. And I actually had, I had one of those moments when I was, when I was deep in plant medicine, 
Uh, it was actually one of after one of the ceremonies. I did several of them, and, and at one point, I had one of those moments where I sat there and thought to myself, "You know what I do? I, I coach people, right? I, I I give people advice. I give people structure. I I, I guide them. I, I coach people, and, and that's effective. Like psychotherapy is like any type of therapy can be really effective, depending on the coach, depending on the therapist, depending on the individual." Um, but when it comes to something like plant medicine and, and the depths that that goes to and the speed that it happens, I had one of those moments where I thought, how the fuck would I have actually achieved what I've achieved without this? You know, I, I, just, I just had one of those moments where I had a realisation of how intelligent and how effective plant medicine was. I, I had a whole new level of respect, level of respect for plants. Plants in general, not just not just you know medicinal plants but i'm talking about plant life in general i thought this is intelligent beyond our wildest wildest imagination yeah it's hard to compete with uh millions of years of evolutionary biology right like just the the whatever environment you're in it's going to find a natural symbiosis at some point right that life is just about balance hot and cold or whatever that's what a star is it's gravity and nuclear fission fighting against each other until it becomes balanced you know what i mean like the the biggest and smallest things in the universe all follow the same pattern so why the fuck are we not following it you know what i mean uh, <laughs> i always tell people like the first time you do plant medicine especially if it's one of the strong ones you're probably just going to be trying to survive the experience not that it's actually dangerous but in your own head because you've never experienced anything like that before but the second time you're going to have a plan I, i've seen this hundreds of times people do it the first time like wow that was intense you know what i should have done was I should have been thinking about this, so it would have popped up when I was doing. So, like, yeah, there you go, right? That's that's a good that's a good way to go about it. <sighs> but you know, there's it's not just about that. Like, you make realizations. That's like that's like uh, uh, identifying a problem, right? You're not solving your problems on plant medicine. You're identifying them, in my opinion. Then you go out into yeah. your real life, yeah. and then you start solving them. And that's kind of one of the one of your primary. Uh, mode modes now is the uh, modern warrior project. Tell us about that and what that is. So, so that's essentially following a set of principles and a structure that people can people can relate to. And it's, I guess it's taking away all the confusion because what do people do? They get paralysis by analysis. They 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 don't do introspective work. They just they know that something's wrong and they just survive their way through life. They 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 get into routines and habits that don't serve them. They they know they're doing things that that is sabotaging behavior, but they can't find a way out or don't know how to get out of it. So it's a bit like someone who's fat. They know that they eat like shit. They know they don't move enough or properly, uh, but they can't find a way to get themselves to do the work. It's not like they don't know how to do it. Because let's face it, there's so much information out there now. You could learn how to do anything on YouTube pretty much, right? Within reason. Um, but you'd only you'd only learn if you put the time in and the effort to actually find out what that information is, whether it be reading books, looking at videos, speaking to mentors. The information is all, everything you need is there, right? especially when it comes to information. But it's about how, did it, how does the person, how do you package something together that takes away the overwhelm and the confusion? Because going back to the example of someone who's overweight and needs to get in shape, it's not that they don't know what to do. Mm. They're just confused about where to start, what's the best way, and then taking the action steps and, and being accountable for themselves, which is usually the part that's not like, they, it's not they don't know what to do. They know how to do everything. They just go, fucking just can't be bothered or I feel lazy or I'm stuck and I just feel like I'm procrastinating all the time and I, I need motivation, you know, that's one of the one of the classic ones. And you're like, where the fuck does motivation come from? Why, why aren't you motivated? You know, motivation isn't something you need to then act. It's something that shows up when you're already doing the work and getting results. That's when you feel motivated. Um, at least more on a more regular basis. So, so what I do is I I kind of help people understand themselves, and at, at the root of all this is is helping people understand the subject of self awareness. And let's face it, if you can be self aware, you know where you are. It's like know where you are in the map before mm. going to the next checkpoint or the next grid reference. If you don't know where you are, you're fucked from the get go. So. I suppose the first part of this is, is is helping people establish where they are before they do anything else, uh, and really getting a, a, a you know a handle on here are the aspects of your life, 
here's how you are being truthful and rating them. So one of the things I always tell people is to is to is to tell the truth, you know, because the, the truth does set you free, so mm. to speak. And people just spend most of their time lying to themselves. because uh, it's too it's too scary to face the truth. Hence why the introspective work, the you know, what we spoke about before, there are questions there, there are things that that are kind of in the dark side of someone's life potentially. They just don't want to face them. It's no different than bills piling up on your side on your work surface in the kitchen that you know debt letters come through the door and you know that what's inside those envelopes is not what you want to read there's loads of red ink in there mm-hmm. you know it's there you know that you need to do but you just think fuck it i'll leave it and i just won't open it and it'll I'll, I'll, I'll just ignore it for a little bit it's only a matter of time before that pip shit piles up and you get a yeah. knock on the door and people, people are taking things things out your fucking house yeah. and that, the crossover to that is going to the doctor when you've been eating shit too too much and drinking too much alcohol and getting fat and unhealthy and then the doctor says well you're going to develop type 2 body beat you're, te- you're you're pre-diabetic or you you your fucking your blood work's not so good right so you're going to die in the next five years if you don't do something about this oh shit i better do something about it now so i guess my my role is to really you know provide provide a a coaching service that that, that, that takes people in uh, meets them where they are and helps them understand themselves and sort of open up open up the lid and or pop the hood in their in their life and say, right, this these are the things that, that let's do a diagnostics and what's going on right now. And then look at why and then teach them about introspection, how to ask themselves a relevant question, how to do the deep work. And then get to the get to the get to the core the root cause of things. But I, I don't necessarily do that straight away because all people need to start with is just to do something that's going to get them some kind of result. So I, I, honestly, from the get-go, I keep it very basic. But we, we operate off three three main pillars. So the three the three pillars of the modern warrior really is is purpose, path, and power. Uh, like, like three parts of a triangle. And purpose is essentially where they're going. Path is how they're going to get there. And then the power side of things is really their main body and being, you know, that everything that's encompassed into the into the, the human being of of what makes them up, the physical matter in the empty space, the thoughts and the processes. So so I guess, you know, when it comes to that, you know, you know, where are you going, what's your purpose, trying trying to help someone identify their purpose. Uh, and that can take some time. It doesn't always happen overnight, but trying to get them to the point where they're starting to think about it at least. Then when they know where they've got something to go, they've got reason to be here. They've got purpose as a father, as a husband, as a as a, a as a leader, as a human being. You know they've got something that they can get out of bed for in the morning and give themselves substance in life and look forward to things. Essentially, it's understanding about you know what are their what are their goals, what is their mission. Um, when it comes to the 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 subject of path, it's about analyzing where they are. So analysis, strategic planning. And then the execution of that plan, and I just say to them, "Look, I'm never going to do any of this for you. I'm just like the shepherd, you know. I'm I'm there to be at the checkpoints to say, you know, where are you now? Where are you going next? How are you going to get there? Right off you go, and I'll check in with them again. And it's it's, it's an accountability situation. Um, but when it comes to power, I suppose everything really starts there. So the first thing I want everyone to do really is to optimize their their habits and stuff. So like things like self care, non negotiables." implementing some basic self-care habits, eradicating a few things and, and doing it bit by bit, not trying to change everything overnight. It's about helping them identify what they can do and what they can stick to so they don't speed off like a spring chicken only to fall flat on their face within a week because they've started too much too soon and they get overwhelmed and can't sustain it. So it really is about, pay- I teach guys about you know a few principles. So truth is the first one. Patience is another factor. Um, it's all about patience. We all want results tomorrow, but you have to understand that this is the long game. And it's about, you know, I, have you seen the film Colors with Robert Duvall? And mm, yeah, yeah. You know the classic line when he says, Dad, Dad, let's run down there and fuck one of those cows. Mm-hmm. Robert Duvall says, and the daddy bull says, no, son, let's let's walk down. Fuck, fuck them all. all. Yeah. <laughs> and I always go back to that. It's a really, really good metaphor. And it relates to patience. It relates, to, it relates to maturity and the long game. And that's where it really locks in for people. And when you provide a community of people who are like-minded, like-minded men who are not stood at the top of a mountain beating their fucking chest, it's all about connecting with with all sides, you know? So it's about taking yourself and not being a fucking another, not going from a square to a triangle. It's about going from a square to a cube. 
you're trying to build more dimensions onto people's lives and beings and helping them understand themselves better, helping them improve their communication and relationships. And that's what all ties into the power section, you know, and one thing I always ask people is how did you lose your power and how are you, how are you going to get it back? And it always comes back to something. When you, when you follow that trail back, it's always down to something that is a belief. It's a, it's a hard ingrained belief that they just have to start changing. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how it, how the, the project works. And I always say that people people come on the project for a reason. They come for the coaching. They come for the structure. They come for the, what they think they need. They end up with something totally different, and they stay for the community and the environment and the accountability. Yeah. Uh, what's going to what's going to keep them moving forward? I I think uh, that uh, I think that community and accountability, the lesson that it really teaches people, because. The, the, the le- there, there's a couple of lessons that it really teaches people. One is that like, yeah, uh, I can do this. And here's the example, like everybody else is doing it. I can do it too, right? That's part of like the contagion of group psychology. And the other part is like, some people think this purpose-driven stuff is a platitude, but it's very basic biology. I mean, it's like all of the, all of the chemicals, the, the hormones in our body are designed to reward us for doing the right thing, right? For, for performing the correct duties required of us to maintain all of this civilization and shit. Um, and when you fuck up those hormones with, you know, whatever it is, sometimes it's traumatic brain injuries, which is out of your control. But a lot of times it's diet and food. A lot of times it's the, the chemicals you put into your body and shit like that. Then you're fucking up your hardware first, right? And then, you know, yeah. the, the software, the decision-making process that you use, it gets, man, I mean, 96% of the serotonin your body makes is made in your gut. So if, you've, if you're eating like shit and you got bad gut health, you're fucked, man. There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. So, you know, it's like part of being in that group, and it's the same thing that we learned, uh, uh, you know, being gunfighters and shit. These people depend on you. Like that's the, that was the always, I never cared about dying and shit like that. I mean, I've had my buttholes puckered quite a few times getting blown up and shit like that, but um, <laughs> I've never, like, it, that was never my primary concern. My primary fear was letting my men down, right? Because those, those, they become your family after a while. And being back in that community like that, it reminds you of those things. It reminds you, yeah, I can do this. And it reminds you, like, hey, people are fucking counting on you. It's not time to fucking mope around. It's time to do some work, you know what I mean? And uh, to your point about people, you know, using this ostrich technique of burying their head in the sand, bad news doesn't get better with time. Like that, that, that bad thing that's there today is going to be there tomorrow unless you fix it. That's just the way it is. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It's still going to be there tomorrow. It's just going to manifest into something bigger. So you're, you're essentially building a monster. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's just so stupid, but you know, that's the, I think that focusing on problems without having the right infrastructure can fuck you up as a human being. Like when I look at when somebody who is like, let's say a child looks at a house on fire, they're like, Oh shit, that that's really, really bad. What the fuck? If a firefighter looks at that house, they're immediately thinking of ways to solve that problem. Right now. How are you, how are you developing your mind and your, uh, 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 your heart, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, how are you developing that to look at problems in your own life and around you and be competent and handle them? Because pretending like they don't exist doesn't work. Saying woe is me and being a victim doesn't work. There's only one thing that works and it's organized, organized structure towards the goal. That's it. That's all that works. That's why people have been borrowing from military culture in in lifestyle and business since the beginning of military culture. Right. I mean, that's it because it fucking works. Yeah, it's order. It's it's just all it's it's the balance of chaos and order, and you know, oh, if you think about just if you if you over emphasize the whole order thing all the time and you're just super anal about everything you do, then you can cause chaos in that mm-hmm. as a result of that anyway. So it's, again, it's about having enough order. This is this is basic human principles that have been around for forever. You know, we have to live with some kind of order in life, otherwise. There's chaos, so you know it's. I suppose it's getting the balance right, but with, without order, we're all fucked anyway. And the order starts with how you, how you sort of um, 
conduct the basic principles of how you live and that's like the you know the basic fundamentals of living which is like how you move how you eat how you sleep to keep you in order with your human body and your mind that everything starts there only then can you be as effective as possible to do the things that are going to give us mm -hmm. purpose which is to help other people you can't fucking help you can't be you can't help the poor by being one of them you know so so i suppose everything has to start from a self perspective so that you can be selfless and that has to have a level of order otherwise chaos is going to be present almost sure. present yeah it doesn't matter how good of a driver you are if your car is a piece of shit you're probably going to lose the race i mean that's something yeah. that i think is really important to remember so you know and, and it, it also has the added benefit of when you take control of the physical part of your life the diet and exercise and shit like that a lot of these other things just naturally start to fall into place for a variety of reasons one, one you get healthier physically and mentally but also that the order and discipline kind of cascades out through the rest of your life. Like, why, well, why am I doing this? Why am I sitting here for 45 minutes, stared at my phone now? I need to go do something that actually yeah. matters. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> look, I like all the stuff you're, you're doing here. It's a really important thing to be able to, you know, I guess take the rough edges away from, cause I, I don't really, I'm not a huge fan of these like male boot camps, like adult boot camps and shit that people go to and get yelled at and stuff like that. I just don't see the purpose in that. But stripping all of that, that rough edge away and delivering the actual message, that's just what, what we're talking about is just what men used to be, right? And yeah. again, I want to call it back before we get out of here. I want to call it back to the, we, it doesn't, that cycle of soft times creating soft men, that doesn't have to be the case right yeah we, we can we can fix that and, yeah we can fix it by doing the kind of stuff that you talk about so tell everybody where they can find you where they can find the modern warrior project so so really i, I get most of my traffic through instagram so my instagram handle is at the lindsey bruce so t-h-e lindsey bruce probably best if you post that because no one's going to know how to spell it but um <laughs> yeah the lindsey bruce or, or you can catch me at lindsey at the modern warrior project.com that's my email my direct email so uh, those are the two main sort of means of contact. I, I don't, I, I'm actually having a new website built at the moment, so there's nothing active they can go and look at right now, but all the information that they need would be obviously via my social media. Cool. Well, you guys, everybody go check it out. Uh, check out the uh, Instagram page. Check out, if you if you want to, you can also link up on LinkedIn. I see you've got a page here. Yeah, uh, page. People can DM you with that one. So it's just yeah. Lindsay with an A, Bruce. Pretty easy to find. Yeah. The Lindsay Bruce, yeah. yeah. Um, well, look, yeah. thanks for coming today, man. I really appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing out there. Yeah, I really appreciate you inviting me on this podcast, Dan. I've really enjoyed the conversation. You know, um, could probably talk for mm. a week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, you know, if, uh, if my schedule loosens up in the near future, maybe we'll do that. Yeah. Uh, but right now, I can't, unfortunately. But yeah, thank you again for coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I always take a lot. I always take a lot from these things as well. So thanks for your wisdom as well, because I always learn something. So for sure, uh, thank man. you. Yeah, thank you for coming. I appreciate you saying that, and uh, yeah. we'll see you again soon. Whenever, whenever we'll circle back around to this conversation again sometime soon. Awesome stuff, mate. I'd love that. All right, thanks for coming, man. And thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen. Peace.